can't work a job. I've got to fast 24 hours a day. I've got to read the scripture 24 hours a day. I'm, I'm too spiritual to work this job. You're not allowed to be successful. Education's evil. If you make money, you're bad. Somehow you're not spiritual. And I couldn't disagree more. Praise the Lord, Biblos family. We are so glad that you have returned with us to talk about the great things of God. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as wool. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as snow. We are glad you're here. We trust you are enjoying the blessings of God where you are. Great things are happening in the kingdom. And if you're part of the kingdom of God, it is your hour. It is your day. And it's great to be apostolic. I, um, I've had a lot of things swirling around in my mind. And one of the things that I, I have been giving thought to, and I guess before I say that, let me say this. Um, we love your feedback. Keep sending the messages. Comment in the comment section down below and share this with somebody that, that was that's always been the goal of Biblos is to help win the lost, help disciple people, help encourage people. And so um, send us your messages through email, through Instagram, Facebook, you know, whatever, whatever method works best for you. We do take the time to look at them as best we are able. We, it is a lot, um, but, but we love it. It's great. And, and we're excited to be dialoguing with the great people of God. Your questions are great. Your insights are great. And, and several of our sessions have been inspired by you, dear Biblos listener. The bibliophiles, the theophili, the lovers of God and the lovers of the word. The idea in Biblos when we first began was to help people fall in love with the books, in particular the scripture. And, you know, Oftentimes when I was trying to reach people, talk to people, minister to people, they would say, I don't have time for a Bible study. I don't have time to uh, talk about the things of God. I'm busy. I, you know, I'm working, you know, et cetera. And the idea of Biblos was a pocket Bible study teacher. You can, you can open up your phone. You can simply look at it. And in your spare time, you can follow along. You can read the word of the Lord. You can fall in love with the word of the Lord. And we have the lineup online session. We have uh, different topics that you can dive into. And I, I pray they can be a blessing. I hope they can edify you. I, I want to strengthen the apostolic world. I want to strengthen this next generation with apostolic doctrine. But I also want to present a rational uh, articulation of the word of God for people that want to know more and kind of demystify the scriptures and particularly the apostolic doctrine. So, you know, I mean, if you allow your enemies to describe who you are and what you are, then oftentimes they will caricaturize you. They will paint a cartoon picture of you and, and, and portray you as, as something that you're not. So we get derogatory terms like Jesus only. Um, uh, we get lumped in with a lot of, groups that are fringe groups, um, cult groups. <laughs> we're always asked for snake handlers. And yeah, I guess because we speak in tongues that people just assume we handle snakes and it's, it's a derisive way of, uh, poking fun at us. So we don't have snakes, but we do tread on serpents and scorpions. And then the Bible calls it what it actually is all the wiles of the devil. So we're not picking up literal serpents. We are dealing with the ugly thoughts, the nasty impressions, the, the wicked impressions and ideologies that come against us, that bite us, that inject poisonous, toxic, venomous thoughts and sinful dynamics into our hearts. We handle that. <laughs> 
we overcome that. So having said all that, I I actually had something I wanted to talk about today. It's found in the book of Revelation chapter 10. It talks about an angel, a great angel that comes down from heaven with a loud voice and he sets one foot on the land, one foot on the sea, and he roars with a loud voice. It's an amazing image. His feet are pillars of fire. He is a, a, an iconic image. And heaven is literally coming to earth and roaring its message. And, you know, there's a lot of speculation as to who that is and what that is. One of the ones I find very interesting is that this is a picture, possibly, of the Reformation. And the reason why people say that is because he had in his hand a little book. And then later he gives to John that little book and tells him to eat that little book. It'll be sweet in his mouth, bitter in his belly. And so the idea is that men would finally have a chance to get their hands on the little book, the Bible, taken from the large scrolls, taken from the mystical um, dark age suppression of the Roman Catholic Church and held captive by academic elites and a a priesthood that was determined to hold sway over the people and hold the people in subjugation. Now the Reformation happens, the printing press is created, and so we get the little book. The angel gives us the little book is the idea. And when that happens, heaven roars. God's message hits the earth like a lightning bolt. This is the day of Michael Servetus. This is the day of of an apostolic coming out, coming out of the dark ages, coming out of the wilderness. I I find it fascinating that the dragon pursues the woman for, um, what is it, 1260 days, and I might be off on that number. I don't have it in front of me right now, but it's right around there, and pursues her through the wilderness. Many people feel that that is the the Catholic Church chasing the people of God, persecuting them, coming against them from that 325 AD into the 1500s, that span of a day for a year, that 1250, 1260, whatever it is, those years, a day for a year, and it takes it into the 1500s where finally the woman has been protected and It's now her time to come out. It's time for the Reformation. The gospel is unleashed throughout the world. And um, yeah, well, anyway, I'm not trying to get into all the eschatological significance of that. What I'm trying to get to is the fact that he puts one foot on the land, one foot on the sea. And I want to point out the duality of the two environments. One is in the water, one is on the land. One, it's a foot in two worlds. And in God's kingdom, we walk with a foot in two worlds. And one of the first times we see this is in Abraham, when God gives to Abraham the covenant and he tells Abraham to count the sand and then he tells him to count the stars. And again, you see the two worlds. You see the natural, you see the heavenly. So Abraham's covenant, uh, which Romans chapter four says that we receive that covenant and Abraham becomes an heir of the world. It's a beautiful promise. And that word world there in Greek is cosmos. We become an heir of the cosmos. And I don't think Christians realize the power that is at their fingertips. You know, Israel will have land. There are land promises that are are given to Israel in the Old Testament. Most people feel that those land promises will be fulfilled and in some ways have been fulfilled by Israel retaking land. Um, But the scripture goes on to talk about the people of God and it tells us interesting things like the meek shall inherit the earth. Abraham would be heir of the cosmos. And what I'm saying is there is a blessing in the Abrahamic covenant that many apostolics need to get their hands on. So many times we focus on spiritual things, as we should. Spiritual always trumps the physical. You cannot morph into the physical dimensions of blessing without handling the spiritual blessings. Um, you know, and, and there, there is a supremacy to the spirit over the flesh. 
when Jesus came to the lame man um, and he, he began to deal with the lame man, he asked him what he wanted. He wanted to walk again. Jesus says, thy sins be forgiven thee. He handles the spiritual first. Out of lameness and sinfulness, Jesus deals with the sinfulness first because that is the priority. The spiritual always trumps the physical. But then Jesus says that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He says to the lame man, rise, take up thy bed and walk. And he walked. So the physical follows that. So that's, that's a pattern in the scripture that there will be the spiritual application and the physical will follow it. Um, and I have, a, I have a dear friend, you know, Pastor Caleb Adams in Memphis, Tennessee. He preaches uh, a great message that we, uh, I don't know if he had titled it this, but we refer to it as this, uh, the fish, the fowl, and the cow. That would, something, the fish, the fowl, and the cow. I believe that's what it is. Um, basically, he shows the progression in Genesis, how God God creates the fish in the sea. He creates the fowl in the air, and then he creates the cow, the beast of the field. And God wants to give us those things. And if we will get dominion in those dimensions, God will progressively give it to us. So there are things under the surface in the spirit world, you have to get dominion over. And then there are things in the air that are spiritual that you have to get dominion over. And if you will get dominion over those arenas, those atmospheres, those worlds, God will give you the cow. He'll give you the land. He'll give you the beast of the field. He will give you the natural increase. So the fish, the fowl, and the cow. <laughs> get the spiritual right. The natural will follow. So what I'm trying to say is God doesn't just want to give you spiritual dominion. He wants to give you physical dominion. There's a promise in the Bible, and, and it's what Jesus prayed, and it's what we are looking for, and we are praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We get so ethereal and we get so nebulous about spiritual things that we think that natural things don't matter. And some people even think natural things are sinful or that you're bad if you talk about them. I could not disagree more. I believe that we are body, soul, and spirit. And to look at the physical and the fleshly as though it's just evil in and of itself intrinsically is to give into platonic theory that, that somehow this body, this shell is, is to be discarded and we are to only be spirit force. And when we, when we are resurrected that we will all just float out of here and live in spirit bodies floating around in the cosmos somewhere. And you know, when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, um, he had a body, he had a glorified body. The Bible never says we float around, you know, uh, corporeal or ethereal beings, but we have a, we have a body. There is a kind of a body. And, and first Corinthians talks about the flesh, the fish, of, the flesh of fish, the flesh of birds, a fowl, the flesh of, of man, the fle the glory of the terrestrial, the glory of the celestial, the glory of the sun, the glory of the moon. And so he's highlighting the differences between these bodies. Well, Jesus, when he resurrected, had a body. They eventually could touch him. Um, initially, they couldn't because there was some kind of a change happening, but then later they could. He ate with them. Uh, he appeared with them. He disappeared, but there was a body. He walked around and talked with them. He wasn't some translucent guy floating around. That's our template for the resurrection. And I believe that there is a very physical element. We are body, soul, and spirit. So it doesn't say I poof, turn into a spirit when, when the trumpet sounds, I am changed. This mortal puts on immortality. This corruptible puts on incorruption and Jesus, the first fruits of the resurrection is our template for that. What are you saying brother Urshan? Okay. So I am saying that there are many Christians who make the mistake of not living with one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. You're supposed to be able to operate in the spiritual and the natural. You're supposed to operate in the sand and the stars. God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost and he wants to bless you financially. He wants, to, he wants you to be healthy in your body. 
a, a lot of Christians neglect their body because they think the body doesn't matter. It's just nothing but spirit. But, but shame on us if we die at 50 because we can't control our diets and because we live gluttonously. And that's not a popular message for everybody, but it's the truth. You know, you need to be around for your children, for your grandchildren. I do too. And so we, we discipline ourselves. We, we practice moderation and temperance and, and we, we exercise, (laughs) go to the gym, lift weights, have some resistance training. If you don't use it, you will lose it. And so apostolics don't need to be at the end. They don't need to be uh, at the back of back street. They need to be the best they can be. Have one foot on the sea, one foot on the land. Take care of your body. Take care of your family. Spend time with your children. I've known pastors that thought they were doing the work of God by attending to nothing but the church and, and, and nothing but church people. And, you know, I, I appreciate sacrifice and I thank God for it. Thank God for men of God who took time, but your family is your, one of your main priorities, your wife, your children, your husband, take time with them. If I can't lead my family, I have no business leading the house of God. The scripture teaches, and that's a very physical thing. It's a very natural thing, but I want my, my family to go to heaven with me. I want to take the time to make sure the house of God is a sanctuary, not a place of drudgery and a place to be avoided. I don't want my kids being pulled into the world and pulled into, into Hades while I'm over here praising God, oblivious, trying to grab for the stars. There's some very sand, earthy, natural dynamics that I need to be paying very close attention to. So I want to have one foot on the land and one foot in the sea. I can remember when I first began to realize this and get this revelation, you know, I, I always thought God would just provide, you know, like with ravens, (laughs) like over the brook Kidron bread would just fall out of the sky. And God does. There are great miracles. I've had miracles happen. I've had God miraculously provide, but there is also an administration where God will then open up doors for you. He'll give you opportunities. If you're walking in his spirit and walking according to his will, things will just open to you that you never could have realized in and of yourself, in your flesh. And there'll be natural things. God will give you an opportunity to buy a house. God will give you a good deal on a house. And God will let you get education. I believe in getting education. And I know that scares some people because so many young people oftentimes go off to college or to a university and there's dangers there. There's pitfalls. But that danger is not education. That danger is secularism. And so if you can work up the courage to prepare yourself to prepare your children to live strongly weight equally distributed you don't want to get out of balance you don't want to get too much in the sea too much on the land you want it you had one foot in both worlds equal distribution you know you can become so spiritual that you can't even work a job i've had people tell me before i i can't work a job i've got to fast 24 hours a day i've got to read the scripture 24 hours a day i'm i'm too spiritual to work this job well Tell that to your mortgage company and your landlord. You know, God expects us to live in this world. He expects us to pay our bills and to be good stewards. And I make the strong case that your spiritual acumen will be revealed in how you handle your business. Your finances will reflect your responsibility, your your faithfulness, your honesty, your integrity. People want to do business with honest people, with charismatic people, charismatic in a good sense, full of charisma, not the religious charismatic. (laughs) If you do good business with one person, they want to do business with you again and they want to do it again. And you can form many, many lifelong friendships and relationships with people because you do a good work and you bring good value to the world around you. 
I always love meeting people who have long, long standing relationships. Be very careful of people who have no old friends. Remember I said that. If you have no old friends and you have a trail of broken relationships behind you, be very careful of, of a person who, who does that. A person's pattern of living over a period of time will reveal who and what they are and the decisions they're making. And if your decisions are joyful and kind and gracious and full of integrity and life and responsibility, people will love to work with you for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Dear friends that, that really care about you and you care about them. That is a reciprocal loving relationship. And people who live with both legs in both worlds, equally distributed, they are blessed. How does that practically play out? Well, if you invest in things, if you invest in property and real estate, that's one way that you can have one foot on the land. If you have a good job, if you work it, you work it diligently, get your education, get your certification, become the best that you can be. I believe in going to college. I believe in furthering yourself. Um, and so maybe that's a way that you can really apply yourself. Some people, college is not for them. Maybe they're more hands-on. So maybe a trade or a skill that they develop. Some people are natural salesmen. I know people that did not graduate from high school that are fabulously blessed and successful in their lives because they found their niche. They were great salespeople and they could, what did they say? Sell ice to Eskimos. <laughs> and and the, the reason I'm bringing this up guys is because when you get the Holy ghost, God doesn't just give you goosebumps. That's operating in the water. When you operate in the spirit, you're operating in the water. It's a subterranean world. It's an aquatic world. It's a, it's a strange world that is juxtaposed to the land, to the terra firma. What is dry, what is familiar, what is <clears throat> solid is contrasted by what is liquid, by what is shifting, by what is moving, but that has a dy dynamism to it. That's the spirit world. It's a metaphor for the spirit world. And when God fills you with the Holy Ghost, you are walking in that spirit world. You, <clears throat> you have one foot in the water. But it gives you very beautiful fruits of the spirit and great character traits, honesty, loyalty, love, faith, uh, meekness, temperance, um, all of the good fruits, all of the good traits that begin to emerge, the world cannot compete with that. You will outcompete every irresponsible person, every person who is bound by addiction, every, every free person will outcompete the enslaved. You, you, your joy should shine to everybody around you. Your happiness, your kindness, your love, your care for people. You know, people just assume that there's this magical blessing that Joseph had in Potiphar's house. But, but Joseph was applying scriptural New Testament principles in the Old Testament. When Potiphar gave him a task, he exceeded that task. He did more than was required of him. If you remember of Paul, when he spoke to um, Philemon about Onesimus, he said, I know that you will do more than I ask. Well, <clears throat> to do more in the case of Joseph and in the case of Philemon is to obey the Sermon on the Mount mandate. If someone asks you to go a mile, go twain. If someone asks for your coat, give him your cloak also. It is, it's going the extra mile, as it were. It is exceeding expectations. It is finding out what they, what a person wants, what a person needs and going beyond what they thought was possible and doing it over and over and over. And because you're not doing it to the person, you're doing it to the Lord. You know, we're taught not to give <clears throat> honor to our leaders with what the Bible calls eye service as men players, men pleasers, but we are supposed to do it as unto the Lord. So when I work for somebody, I'm not working for the person so much as I am working for the Lord. I want the Lord to say, well done. The Lord is watching my work. I can't do slipshod work. This has got to be the best work. This has got to be the best effort. This has got to, I'm coming early and I'm staying late. I'm taking care of people around me. I'm, I'm feeling every subtlety, every nuance. I'm, 
I'm, I'm feeling the vibrations. I'm finding out what they need, and I am meeting that need because I am God's son, and I represent my heavenly father on the earth. When I do that, the world opens up in a dynamic way. So Joseph shoots to the top of Potiphar's house. He shoots to the top of the jailer's um, care. They depend on him. He, he makes himself invaluable and, and, and God blesses him because of it. It wasn't magic. It wasn't some kind of um, <clears throat> vibration he had. It was him applying the scriptural principles and the spirit of God working through that. And so if I put one foot in that spirit world and one foot in that natural world, I can roar. I can give voice to the great things of God. Men can hear the great of the great things of God. And they can hear about it through my lifestyles and my choices, my lifestyle and my choices. Um, I remember as I began to make good decisions and I stopped making bad decisions. I stopped making carnal decisions. I made spiritual decisions. I started investing. I was diligent in my investment. I, w- I invested in real estate. I bought homes. I bought investment homes. I bought land. We developed land. And it was a very natural application to my life. It it wasn't about praying and fasting, although we did pray and we, we sought the face of God over each opportunity that was presented to us. But what I mean is, is some people labor under the mistaken idea that it's wrong to do that, that you you're not allowed to be successful. Education's evil. If you make money, you're bad. Somehow you're not spiritual. And I couldn't disagree more. I think Abraham was mightily blessed. I think the people of God were mightily blessed. I think we are to be mightily blessed. Now, before you take that and critics, which there are one or two critics, um, before you take that and run with it and say, this is prosperity gospel, this is health and wealth gospel. No, no, this is Abrahamic. This is about integrity and honesty and character playing out over time and the blessing of the Lord coming upon a person. Literally, God says, prove me now here with, you know, we interpret that Malachi dynamic, uh, I'll open the windows of heaven over you, pour you out a blessing that you can't contain. It, but the, the actual word is floodgates. I will open the floodgates. There are pent up reservoirs of grace that God wants to pour on his people. Opportunities will come to you that don't come to other people because you're God's man, you're God's woman, and he loves you. And it is his good pleasure to help you, which you then take that blessing and you bless his kingdom. You give your tithe, you give your offering, you help those that are in need, you provide them with jobs, you give them opportunities, you give favors to people that are in need. And God uses you to bless the kingdom. And the more you bless them, the more the blessing comes back. It truly is a factual thing. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So get an education, develop a trade, work hard, develop a skill, whichever one fits you best, be excellent in what you do. Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Maybe your thing's investing. I talked with a group of guys today that are beginning an investment group, and um, they're so excited. They're looking at real estate. I know some people that they they purchase assets and they rent them out. You know, they purchase power equipment, backhoes, um, front end loaders, bobcats, and they rent them out. And they make an amazing living doing that and have a great passive residual income coming in and it becomes their retirement. They, they, and the Lord blesses what they do. If you will commit your way to the Lord and say, God, this belongs to you. Everything I'm doing belongs to you. I belong to you. The Lord will bless you and he'll open up doors for you. And you can live with one foot on the land, one foot on the sea and heaven can roar. And when that happens, God will give you a chance to give the little book. People want to hear what you have to say. They want to know how you did it. They want to know how, why your life is blessed. They're not just hearing your words. They're watching your life and they're seeing your choices in your lifestyle. So take it, inherit the stars, inherit the sand, the two pronged, twofold, heavenly and earthly administration of the Abrahamic promise is played out in the land and the sea. And I pray that you have a foot in both worlds. I hope that helps you. 
I hope that's a blessing to you. And uh, if you have any comments or any suggestions or, or yeah, perhaps questions, shoot them over to us and we will do our best to get to them. God bless you. God keep you. God cause his face to shine upon you. Until next time, we'll see you.